If you had one week to live, seven days, if you knew in seven days, the worst day of your life is coming where you would suffer and die, how would you spend the next week? Would you in fear, you know, just try to avoid that suffering and death at all costs, like hiding out? Would you maybe um, uh, try to knock off everything on your bucket list? Like, I, well, I'm, it's gonna get real rough in seven days. So I'm just gonna do whatever I can to enjoy the next seven days. Would you maybe sit with the ones that you love and have important conversations about what's really matters in life? If you knew in seven days you were gonna die, how would you respond? How would you live? How would priorities change? Today, we're gonna jump back into the series that we, we began months ago in the book of Mark. We took a break from the book of Mark for the life group series on one anothering and for a vision series on where we're going as a church building for generations beyond us. But we're gonna dive back into the book of Mark because we can't one another well and we cannot cast vision and carry it out well if we don't fix our eyes upon Jesus. And so my prayer for us as we jump back into this and go through the rest of the book for the rest of this year and into the coming year is that we would make much of Jesus in our hearts, minds, our community, and in our families, that we would make much of Christ, that he would be magnified in our hearts and that we would see him for the true, beautiful, holy life loving, glorious God that he is. And to that end, let's pray. Father God, I pray that as we enter back into this series, that you would magnify Jesus in our hearts, that we would see the beauty of Christ and how he spent the last week of his life loving and serving sacrificially. God, would you draw us near to yourself and help us to fix our eyes on Jesus in his name we pray, amen. All right, so just as we're jumping back in, a little bit of context, it's been a few weeks before or since we, we've been in the book of Mark. So the last story we went through was on the rich young man. And the rich young man was a story that kind of flipped the disciples' worldview on its head. This was a man who has, has youth and wealth, prosperity, and he comes to Jesus knowing he's missing something. And he says, Jesus, I, 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 what do I do to inherit eternal life? What do I do to receive eternal life? And Jesus uh, saw the real problem in the man's heart is that his possessions and wealth were an idol that he valued above God. And so he says, I want you to go sell everything, then come follow me. And the man goes away despondent and sorrowful because he had much. And the disciples watching this interaction were amazed because to a Jewish mindset, looking at somebody who was youthful and wealthy was an indicator they're blessed by God. And so they asked Jesus, if that guy can't make it in, who can? Like he's blessed, he's youthful, he's got money and resources. How is he not inheriting the kingdom of God? How is he not have eternal life? And, and Jesus says, these things seem impossible to you, but they're not impossible. All things are possible with God. So that's the immediate context. And we're gonna be jumping into Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 32. It says here, and they were on the road going up to Jerusalem and Jesus was walking ahead of them. This is what rabbis of this day did. There were many itinerant rabbis all over the known world at this time. And they had a gaggle of disciples that followed right behind them. The disciples wanted to be covered in the dust of their rabbi because they wanted that kind of intimacy and proximity. And so the disciples are following Jesus. They're being with Jesus to become like him and do as he did. That's what disciples were about back then. That's what discipleship is about today. Being with Jesus to become like him and do as he did. And so they're following him. And it says, and they were amazed and those who followed were afraid. So it appears that there's a crowd beyond just the 12, that there's other men and women who are there. And it says they're amazed and afraid. Now commentators and scholars kind of have two different opinions on this. Firstly, they're amazed and afraid because of what just happened the rich, wealthy guy who Jewish people thought was blessed by God and had in eternal life, had it made spiritually, didn't, d does not inherit eternal life, does not have um, the spiritual life that they thought. And Jesus says, it's impossible for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. So there's this amazement and fear with this teaching. Jesus has flipped their worldview on its head 
But there's another perspective that I think also bears some weight, that as the disciples and Christ march towards Jerusalem and his ultimate sufferings and death, there is a sense in the group that sorrow and suffering is coming. Jesus has already told them that he's gonna suffer. We're gonna see him tell them again today, but, but they already know, they've heard it several times that suffering is coming, that the son of man is gonna die. And as a result of that, there's some amazement about what Jesus has said is coming. And there's some fear, like what is this all gonna mean? And so they're amazed and fearful. And it says, and taking the 12 again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him saying, see, we are going to Jerusalem. So there's this crowd there and he takes the 12 in kind of like a team huddle. I don't play sports. I've never been in one of these before, but I've seen them on TV. And the coach pulls the team and it says, here's the play. You go here, you go there. This is the plan. This is what we're going to do, right? So, so Jesus brings them in and he says, here's what's going to happen. I don't want you to be unaware of what is about to happen to me in Jerusalem. He says, see, we are going to Jerusalem and the son of man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes. So Jerusalem was the seat of the worship of Yahweh. This is where the temple was. This is where sacrifices are offered. This is where people come to worship Yahweh. This is where people come on pilgrimages for festivals and feasts to honor God and the story of God throughout history of God's people. Jerusalem was the seat of the worship of Yahweh. And it says that Jesus is gonna be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes. These are religious leaders who lead God's people in the worship of Yahweh. And look at what he says is going to happen. And they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. Yahweh is coming into the city that is the seat of the worship of Yahweh. And he will be condemned to death by those who proclaim Yahweh's name. And Jesus tells his disciples, I don't want you to be unaware of what's going to come. It's going to get worse than that though. Yahweh, Jesus, the son of man is going to be handed over to the Gentiles. And the Jewish mindset, as they hear this, they're thinking, what, Jesus, you're going to be handed over to the, to the people we, we have revered and we've learned from and, and we, we would consider holy men or the priests and they're going to condemn you? It shouldn't be so. But worse than that, those people are going to hand you over to pagan, idolatrous Gentiles? How could this be? Can you understand how the disciples might feel in this moment? And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. So Jesus uses this, uh, this phrase again. And we've seen this many times in the book of Mark, the son of man. This was a messianic title. And, and as soon as Jesus uses this, the, uh, the disciples would have known this is a reference to the book of Daniel, prophecies about the coming savior of the world, the Christ, the Messiah, the one who was gonna redeem us. And he says, this is what's gonna happen to me. I'm gonna suffer and die and rise. He didn't want them to experience these, uh, these things that are coming without him giving them a lens through which to look at it. Look at the last statement here. After three days, he will rise. He says, look, things are going to get real rough and it's going to lead to my death, but that's not the end. He wanted his disciples to have a lens over the events they were about to see. And so there's this real somber, sobering moments of Jesus saying, this is what's going to happen to me. And and I'm sure there's all kinds of mixed emotions. What do you mean there? We thought you're going to have a kingdom and we're going to have positions of prestige and, or, or there's, there's the, the sorrow of the loss of a friend and a rabbi. But in the midst of this whole somber, sobering moment, look at what James and John do. Verse 35, and James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they're also known as sons of thunder, came up to him and said to him, teacher, we want you to do whatever we ask of you. That's a presumptuous question. That's like saying, God, I want you to be my vending machine. Like, give me whatever I want, right? Like, put yourself in Jesus' shoes right here. Like, how would you respond to this, right? This is a prideful, presumptuous question. It's like your kid coming up to you and saying, mommy, daddy, I want you to do whatever I want. And you just have to that bend to the will of a tyrant toddler, okay? Like, that's what they're doing. This is prideful presumption. They're, it's almost like they're commanding Jesus, 
And they forgot who's rabbi and who's teach and who's student here. Teacher, we want you to do whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? Look at the response of Jesus. He doesn't rebuke them. He doesn't belittle them. He doesn't like instantly evaporate them. Like, I mean, he's so gracious and so kind. His response to their prideful arrogance, their desire for uh, him to do whatever they want. He responds with kindness and grace. What is it that you want me to do for you? Verse 37, they said to him, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Now, in, in Jewish mind, the right hand was a seat of authority and power and the, the left hand was like second chair. And I'm sure James and John are arguing behind the scenes about which chair they get, which side they get to sit on. But here they're asking for positions in the kingdom of God, in the glory of Christ, of power and prestige and authority. And it seems that they want the adulation of the masses. They want people to look at them as like, Wow, those guys are the spiritually elite. They've got some stuff together. They're spiritual powerhouses. This is pride. This is arrogance. And look at again how Jesus responds. Jesus said to them, you do not know what you're asking. Again, he doesn't rebuke them. He doesn't belittle them. And I, this is a, a brief aside. I didn't actually plan on saying this. this is a brief aside, but this is not the main point of the passage. But look at how Jesus responds to his disciples when, when they are getting it wrong, when they have totally missed the point of his whole ministry of serving and loving others. Instead, they're looking for opportunity to elevate themselves. He kindly and graciously meets them right where they're at. Discipleship is messy. <laughs> it's messy and it takes time and it takes deep relationship and it takes patience to sit down with people like James and John who are active or who are living in a prideful posture and to be kind and gracious and truthful. Discipleship is messy. It was messy then and Jesus was the one discipling them. It's still messy today. All right, let's jump back in. So, so they're, they're saying, we want these positions of power and prestige, okay? And then he says, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? Now, Jesus uses these two symbols, which um, may be lost on some of us. So I just wanna explain that. The cup all throughout scripture is like uh, an ind indication of suffering. The bitter cup, that, that phrase in our language, it's where we get it. A bitter cup of suffering that Jesus is gonna undergo suffering ahead. But then he uses another idea of baptism to add flavor to the cup. The cup is a bitter cup of suffering. Baptism isn't like when we get baptized after we've chosen to follow Jesus as a symbol of what Christ has already done for us. Baptism that he's talking about here, the word baptism is baptizo and it literally means to be immersed in. And so Jesus is saying that bitter cup that I'm about to drink, the suffering that's coming, I'm gonna be actually immersed in suffering. I'm gonna be immersed in sorrow. And he asked James and John, are you able to drink the bitter cup of suffering that's coming? Are you able to be immersed in the suffering that's coming? I mean, if Jesus is asking me that, I'll be like, okay, Jesus, you're right. I don't want that. Um, let's try a different route. But look at what James and John say. And they said to him, we are able. <laughs> I mean, this is total arrogance and pride, right? And I think it's easy for us to just belittle the disciples, but they're dynamic individuals. They're humans. And what nobody talks about when we look at this passage is what they got right. They said, Jesus, we want to be with you in your glory. They knew that on the other side of the sufferings that Jesus is talking about here, the glory was there for him, that he will be honored and revered and glorified in the heavenlies, that Jesus has a beautiful future ahead of him. And James and John are trying to use that for their own selfish gain but they did get it right, that Jesus will be in glory. And they're saying, we want to be with you there. And my curiosity about this story is, do they desire that? Not just because of pride, but because they wanna be close to Jesus. 
We know John, the guy who's here, he calls himself the beloved disciple. This is the guy who leans on Jesus at the Last Supper. This is a guy who has intimacy with Christ. I wonder if the question is also mixed with this pride because we often have mixed motives is also, I really do wanna be close to you, Jesus. So it's a curiosity I have, but, but they're saying we're able, <laughs> we can handle it. We'll, we'll take the suffering. We'll be immersed in sorrow and suffering and, and we'll drink the bitter cup, we're fine. And look at Jesus says, and Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. So he says, look, the, the suffering I'm going to experience and the baptism of suffering I'm going to experience, I, I, you will experience those. And we know from church history, James and John are the first and last disciples to experience martyrdom. James was the first one. John was the last one. So they did experience suffering like Christ. But to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. So Jesus says, look, you're asking something that even I don't have the ability to grant. There, those positions have been uh, reserved for those that has been prepared for. And then the 10 who weren't a part of this conversation with Jesus, James, and John, they, they, they've been listening in though. Listen to what it says here, verse 41. And when the 10 heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And when I used to read this, I thought they're indignant. They're angry because James and John are putting their foot in their mouth in such a somber moment where Jesus said, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and die. But that's not what indignant means. Indignant is to be provoked to anger because of unfair treatment. They're not angry at James and John because they're being obtuse in the midst of a somber, sobering moment of talking about Jesus' suffering. They're angry at James and John because they want the exact same thing. They want the positions of power and authority and prestige. And they're angry and upset because James and John are pursuing this publicly, outwardly, and they want the same thing. And the 10 heard it and they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. So Jesus again calls the team in. We're gonna have a huddle. Let's get together. I'm gonna tell you what's going on here. I want to teach you something about what's happening in your hearts. This indignant uh, and this prideful desire for power and prestige. You know that the Gentiles considered, who are considered rulers of the Gentile, you know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles, excuse me, lord it over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. So he's saying, look at the world, the world you grow up in with your Roman oppressors. Look at how the Gentiles exercise authority over each other. They lord it over each other. It's master, slave, ruler, servant. He says, you have been discipled by your culture. You've been discipled by your culture and you, you are living as a reflection of the culture. That's what's happening inside of you, James, John, and the rest of the 10. You all are desiring this prestige and adulation and power and authority because that's what you see in the world. But look at what he says, verse 43, but it shall not be so among you. No beating, a, no beating around the bush. You, you can't get, escape this. Jesus says, my people live in an upside down kingdom. We are not people who lord it over one another or exercise authority over one another or rule with an iron fist over one another. That's not what my kingdom is about. I have an upside down kingdom. It is the opposite of what you're seeing in the world. That was true then and it's true now. God's people should not look like the master. As we'll see here in a moment, Jesus says, we're called to look more like the slave. That was true for the disciples as they're desiring this prideful, arrogant position, uh, position of authority and power. It's true for us today. We have a bend towards propping ourselves up over each other. That's the essence of sin, pride. But it shall not be so among you, and then he gives explicit instructions here. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. Now, in our context, when we hear the word slave, it kind of perks up. It's, I mean, there's a lot of baggage with that word. 
And the word here in the original language is doulos. It, there's, there's no getting around it. He, he said slave, he means slave. Slave of all. And then he tells us why. For even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Why is this so important? Because this is the heart of the mission of God. God did not come here uh, uh, to, to be served. He came here to serve and give his life over. We have a servant king. Jesus is the servant king. Look at it again in the passage. He says, for even the son of man. That's like, you can put exclamation points on either side of that phrase. Even the son of man. They would have known the son of man, that that's a messianic title that has immense weight, that it's talking about the redeemer from the book of Daniel. They, They would have had that whole story in their mind as he uses this phrase. This is somebody who has power and authority and who's coming with redemption for God's people. And Jesus says, even the son of man came not to be served, but to to serve, to serve, to give away self-sacrificially to others. And he did this by giving his life as a ransom for many. In the, in the uh, book of Acts, uh, Luke, the author, he talks about Jesus with this title, and I really love it. He calls him the author of life. Isn't that such a beautiful expression of who Jesus is? The author of life. And here Jesus says, the author of life is gonna die. He says, the son of man, even I have come to serve you. And how does Jesus' death serve us? Well, it serves us in the greatest need we have. We have a serious issue. It's called sin. I have it, you've got it. And there's only one way for sin to be dealt with. And sin is so serious because it's the only thing that separates us from God. And so Jesus came resiliently marching towards the cross, living the perfect life that we could never live. And at about 30 years old, he was beaten and mocked and ridiculed and killed. This is exactly what he outlines for us a few verses earlier. He says, see, we're going up to Jerusalem and the son of man, messianic title, will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes and they will condemn him. The very people he came to save are condemning him to death. Jesus was not killed by the ruffians of the day. He was killed by religious people. He was condemned to death and delivered him over to the Gentiles and they will mock him. Let's put ourselves in the shoes of this verse. You ever been mocked or publicly humiliated, embarrassed, where your face gets red and your mind's just racing and you're sweating because it's just so excruciating, the pain of being mocked publicly? Jesus was mock worshiped publicly. And then he was spat on. Think about the indecency, the uncleanness and the disrespect of being spat on. In the the movie, The Passion, they spit right in his face. And I don't know if that's what happened or what, but they spit right in his face. And there's just a level of disrespect that comes with that. And then they flog him with what was called a cat of nine tails. It had little shards of bone and perhaps metal or glass that would rip the skin off. It was nearly a death sentence. And ultimately, They killed him. They killed him. The author of life died. Why? To serve us in the greatest needs of our heart, the deepest longings, the deepest problems that we have. Jesus died out of love for you. His service is love in action. We have a servant king who willingly, even the son of man, served us to the point of death on the cross. But look at the last line here. I think this is so powerful. And after three days, he will rise. The mockings and the shaming and the cross all looked awful and it was. But that's not the end of the story. Jesus is certain and sure about his victory over the grave, over sin and over Satan. He says, I will rise. He overcame. 
It wasn't as though they were unsure of kind of what was going to happen on the other side of the cross and the father had a harebrained plan. Let's just try this and see what happens. No, they knew that they would triumph over our enemies through Jesus on the cross. What looked like humiliation was actually victory. And I love this picture of Jesus as he lays out What's going to happen? He's not unaware of what awaits him in Jerusalem and he goes there anyways, out of love for you. I'm reading a book by a guy named Brennan Manning. He's an author and a Franciscan priest. And he has this quote that I just love because I think it's the essence of what we see on the cross. He says, define yourself radically as one beloved of God, as one beloved by God. That's who you are. The cross is the evidence of that. And Jesus is predicting what's about to happen to him. And he still goes because you are radically beloved by God. So if you're here today and you're not a follower of Jesus, can I implore you? I'm gonna go back a slide here. Can I implore you to wrestle with these verses? Christ did this for you to deal with your sin once and for all. And all that is required of you to receive the forgiveness and grace that, you, that is offered to you in the cross and resurrection of Jesus is repent of your sin, which is a turning away from sin and trusting Jesus, placing your faith in Jesus. And in doing so, you have been transferred from darkness to light, from guilty to forgiven. I implore you, wrestle with these verses. Christ did this for you. And if you're a Christian and you're here today, I want you to marvel at our God. Look at what he did for you. Look at what he did for me. Look at what he did for us. The beatings, the mockings, the humiliation and the murder of our God was on our behalf because we are again, radically loved by him. That's good news. Jesus finished it all out of love for you. We have a servant king who wants us to live in a servant kingdom. The servant kingdom is what Jesus envisioned as we receive his love and grace and humble service to us on the cross. We're now called to spread that like confetti. Look at it here in the passage. He says, and Jesus called to them and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. So he says, look at the world. That's a bad example. Don't be like them. But it it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you. Notice he does not rebuke their desire for greatness. He just, just, he he changes what greatness truly is. He is upside down view of what greatness really is. He doesn't doesn't rebuke them for desiring to be great. He just clarifies what greatness is. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Servant. The word there in the original language is diakonos. And diakonos literally means one who does the bidding of another. It's like somebody who waits on hand and foot for people. He says, that's what greatness is. Diakonos, servanthood. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. Now that word slave in our our context is often very loaded, but Jesus means slave of all. Well, what about this person? Jesus, I don't really like them. No, slave of all. God's people are called to look more like servants and slaves than masters and rulers. Why? Because that's what our God did for us. And as we are recipients of the beautiful grace of Jesus Christ, grace upon grace, we're called to graciously and humbly serve the least of these even. He's a slave of all, anybody. So I just want us to have gracious curiosity for ourselves. Do we look like servants or do we look more like masters? Husbands, wives in your marriage. Does it look more like servanthood, mutual servanthood? Or is it master, slave, ruler, servant? Bosses and employees in the workplace Do you go in with this perspective of Christ that says we're there to serve? We're there to be a slave because what we've experienced from Christ. That doesn't mean there's not leadership. Of course there is. But the humble service that says, I will do the bidding of others because of what Christ has done for me. 
Do you look more like the ruler or do you look more like the servant? Do you look more like the master? Do you look more like the slave? Have gracious curiosity in evaluating that for yourself today. And so the disciples get this important teaching on what the kingdom of God is really like, that it's a kingdom of servanthood. It's a kingdom with a servant king who came to serve his people. And then the disciples get an open book test on, an, uh, on serving people. There's an opportunity right in front of them to serve people. Continuing on in the passage. And they came to Jericho. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples in a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. So there's a, a blind beggar. We know from cultural and historic uh, uh, sources that beggars were kind of viewed as unclean. And usually their ailments were viewed as uh, a byproduct of some immense sin that, they, got, that has, they had in their life. And so God kind of smote them. So Bartimaeus would have been viewed as somebody who had sinned greatly. So God made him blind. And there was, this is such a problem in the Roman empire that they actually made a status for beggars called legal beggars to try to legislate and, and uh, organize this whole system so that the begging didn't get out of control in the empire. And so uh, blind Bartimaeus, he's sitting there by the roadside. This is a perfect opportunity for the disciples to live out what they just heard from Jesus. He's sitting there by the roadside, verse 47. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Notice he says, son of David. This is an indication he knows who Jesus is. Son of David, have mercy on me. And how did the disciples and others that are with Jesus respond? And many rebuked him. Man, what did we just talk about like seven seconds ago? Serving, slave of all even blind beggars, even the outcasts. But that didn't stop Bartimaeus, but he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man saying to him, take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, rabbi, let me recover my sight. Notice Jesus asks him the same question that he asked James and John just a few verses earlier. Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. We are called to serve. Our God call, calls us and served even the least of these, even the outcasts. Let's look at it again here. It says, when he had heard it, Jesus was, of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him. Like this is their opportunity. You just heard from Jesus is about serving and slavery and loving even the least of these. And you totally missed the point. Telling him more, telling him to be silent. Listen again, discipleship is messy. Jesus just taught them and they still haven't caught it. Discipleship is messy. Son of David, have mercy on me. Verse 49, Jesus stopped and said, call him. Look at that. Jesus stopped. Now Jesus has a holiday ahead of him. They're gonna go celebrate Passover. There's a, likely a large crowd with him as they go and there's anticipation about the holiday. There's preparation for it. Um, he, he's got Jerusalem ahead of him and sufferings and he's got a big crowd with him. Jesus has got lots on his plate, but he was interruptible. And he hears this man, he was listening. He heard the needy. He heard the cry of someone, the cry of faith of Bartimaeus. And he stops and then he calls him. He said, he said to them, call him. He told his disciples to call him over. Now I don't wanna make too much of this, but I think it's interesting. Jesus invites them into the opportunity to serve this blind beggar. The one who they just rejected and said, be silent. They, he call, calls him over and they called the blind man saying to him, take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Now, I always thought that was a weird detail. Mark's not a detailed guy. So Mark, why are you talking about his clothing? Like it's, it's, it's strange, right? Well, for a beggar in the Roman empire, one of the indicators that they were a legal beggar, that they had that status was what was called a beggar's cloak. 
And so this is an immense moment when you understand that culture. Bartimaeus is getting up in faith. He knows his life is about to be changed. He throws off his beggar's cloak, which is the only thing that would have made him able to legally beg as a blind man. He's like, I don't need this anymore. Jesus is going to heal me. This is an act of faith. He throws it, he springs up, he runs over to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, rabbi. Now the word there in the original language is rabbi, which is a strengthened form of rabbi. Rabbi means teacher. Rabbi means more like, or rabbi means more like master or Lord. And so he says, rabbi or rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. This is a man whose life was totally radically transformed. Think about Bartimaeus sitting there on the street, just hearing the rabble of the crowd. And then finally he hears Jesus' voice. That's the man who's gonna change my life. And his life is forever changed. Jesus is the servant king who takes outcasts and beggars and makes them children. He takes enemies and rebels and makes them sons and daughters of God. Jesus has the power to transform lives. And I think it's so interesting here. Jesus says, go your way. And Bartimaeus says, I'm with you. I'm following you. And he follows right behind all the gaggle of the disciples here. Jesus is the one who takes beggars and makes them children, which is great news for us because we were worse than beggars. We were enemies of God. And now he calls us sons and daughters because of the finished work of Jesus. Do you look like Christ in this story? Have you experienced the love of the servant King? I'm gonna release to the campuses. I love you guys. All right. Thank you guys so much for sticking around. Um, it's, it's a joy to be here with you today. And I just want to have a moment where we evaluate for ourselves. Okay. And this is, a, a, I want you to engage in what I call gracious curiosity, which means whenever we have to look at hard things in our lives, we stay rooted in the identity of grace that God has given us. And so I want you to have gracious curiosity for yourself and just to ask this question. Do you look more like a servant or a ruler? Think about the roles you have in your life. Maybe it's a spouse or maybe it's parenting or maybe it's employee or employer or in your friendships. Do you look more like a servant or a ruler? Which one of those is truly what is exhibited in your life? If you were to be brutally honest with yourself with gracious curiosity that says, no matter what the answer to this question is, I'm still a child of God but to be honest with yourself and evaluate whether or not you are a servant or a ruler. And then what is the step towards what Jesus calls us to, to be slave of all? Let me pray for us. Father, this is a hard challenge to be slave of all, to be servant. It goes against our flesh. It goes against what the world teaches us. Uh, It goes against so much of what's ingrained in us. And so I just pray as we have gracious curiosity, for ourselves, that, that uh, you'd help us to, to honestly evaluate wh- whether or not we look more like the ruler or the servant, and then help us to take the steps of receiving the loving kindness of the servant king so that we can go and do likewise to others. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys for hanging out with me. I love you. Have a good Sunday.